I'm so proud of everything that you've been putting together for this event. And I want to talk to you uh, this afternoon about, about innovation, about how it is that we come up with breakthrough ideas and how we can make those ideas happen. It looks like you've had an absolutely exceptional day of insight. And I want to sort of bring those together into a particular philosophy, if you will. And if there's three words I want you to remember from this talk, it is that diversity drives innovation. I want to show you why that is and what you can do about it. That sort of is the whole setup for it. Um, before I do that, I thought I should take maybe, um, uh, maybe 75 seconds, uh, maybe 90, to tell a bit myself where I come from, why I'm even interested in this topic. Does that make sense to you? Yes? yes? yes. OK. I'll do that then. Uh, the answer to the question where I come from is my parents. <laughs> so you need to know something about my parents. Okay, my mother is black. Uh, the screen is a little bit off. Uh, black and Cherokee. Uh, my dad is Swedish. And they met in Germany, obviously. <laughs> but I was born and raised in Sweden, which is located here. Now, something about Sweden is the time I grew up in this country. Okay, Sweden consisted essentially of two groups of people. Right, one group was blonde, blue-eyed, and quite reserved. And the other group was me, basically. <laughs> now, uh, actually, that was me and my sister right here. Um, this is my favorite hobby. Here's my favorite movie. <laughs> Here's my favorite book. I went to college at Brown University. I studied environmental science for the following reasons. When I did that, I saw something interesting. There were a lot of different scientific researchers at this campus. But in the field, all these researchers were able to connect the purpose of their research with each other. I wanted them to do that. So I created a science magazine with that intent. Oh, thank you. Oh, this is looking great. Who's doing this? Who's doing this? Thank you. Anyway, I, I, I appreciate that the slides are coming out the way I wanted to. Uh, I started a science magazine with that intent. It's actually still around today, and it's the 20th anniversary. Uh, this inspired me to start a healthcare company based on my aunt's research at Johns Hopkins. She's actually the first black female tenure professor at Johns Hopkins in 1990, which you know, kind of seems late in the whole thing of things. Um, then I went to business school at Harvard, started a software company, which did great, until it didn't. <laughs> and then I got an idea for a book. I'd seen that in my life, whenever I was able to combine the concepts from the different cultures I've been exposed to, or from the different industries I've been exposed to, whenever I was able to step in to the intersection of these different industries and cultures, I had a better chance to break a new ground. And I wondered, is sort of this a general truth for innovation? I decided to research that. It took me far than I ever imagined. I was literally down from last $2.45. But things started turning around. The book came out. People really liked it. As you heard, it had been translated to 18 languages. Uh, I wrote another book called The Click Moment, which came out a couple of years ago. Uh, and with that, I enabled me to start a company called The Medicine Group, and we work with some absolutely terrific clients uh, all over the world, uh, helping them innovate and break new ground in the most sort of amazing of ways. In the middle of this, I got married. Now I have a daughter. Oh, wow. I moved to Brooklyn, and now I have a daughter. <laughs> Actually, I have two. And I'm here with you. It's basically my story <laughs> of this particular point in time. Thank you. So I want to do a very quick exercise with you right now. It's a very simple exercise, but I'd like you to sort of pour your heart and soul into it. I'm going to put up some words on this screen, and I want you to yell out the things that you think of when you see these words. Okay, not just one thing, but two things, but keep it on, three, four, five, whatever comes to mind, the first things that come to mind. All right, are you with me? Yes. Are you with me? Yes. yes. Turn on. Surgery and Formula One. It's a connection between termites and architecture. 
Bikinis and burkas is something packed in common. And so does ice and sleeping beds. And at this point in my talk, I will more or less point out this to you. The techno music of Martin Luther King, uh, I don't know what to say that. <laughs> really? How can I cannot say that? I couldn't even dare <laughs> say that. <laughs> Thank you. That was intriguing. <laughs> Could you still hear me back in the room without the mic? Yeah. See? <laughs> but now I have the mic. Thank you. Awesome. Um, and I say this because we have the best chance of breaking new ground when we combine concepts from different cultures, from different industries, from dis different disciplines. Now, of these combinations have come some fascinating innovations. Of course, you know that innovation is critical. Otherwise, you wouldn't spend the day here. In fact, it is at the heart of understanding how the world changes and how you can have your opportunity in it. Now, the interesting thing about this is that there's never been a better time to innovate than now. You are actually the luckiest generation around for doing so. We are. There's never been a better time to innovate than now. It's never been easier to do it than now. And this is why I want to dispel right away one of the things about how we think about success. Because there is this persistent idea that you have to have deep expertise in order to be successful. You need to have understand something cold. You need to have all the sort of the insight before you can even attempt to try to address it. And the reason this myth persists is because we see that it works. Of course, we see people succeed because they've been successful. This is particularly true in areas where we draw a lot of inspiration from. So for instance, Serena Williams. She's one of the most formidable tennis players who has ever lived. Right? She is, she, OK, so she didn't win the US Open a few months ago. But you know, she won it in 1998. And since then, basically, pretty much the number one player in the world. And her success can be entirely attributed to her deep, deep expertise. In fact, she's an example of a rule that got popularized by an author named Malcolm Gladwell, who wrote a book called The Outliers. And, and that rule is called the 10,000 hour rule. How many of you have heard of the 10,000 hour rule? I'm just curious. OK, great. What that rule says is basically, if you want to become the best in the world at something, then you have to practice for 10,000 hours or more at that thing. And the reason that rule works is because 10,000 hours is a lot of hours. Right? So you're way ahead of everybody else. And Serena is a perfect example of that. Do you realize that she can't remember having lived a single day of her life without having played some sort of tennis? She's just, she's just exceptionally skilled. And this notion has made us believe that this is what it takes to succeed. We need these 10,000 hours in some area or some field. Except this rule doesn't really hold up. Now, does it? How many hours of practice do you think Reed Hastings had in video rentals before he started Netflix? <laughs> right? He rented a couple of movies. He didn't like it. He started Netflix. The team behind Instagram, how much experience do they have in photography? Their company had 13 people when Facebook bought them for a billion dollars. Kodak shut down three months later. The, founders of, the founder of Uber, how much did he know about the tax industry? Airbnb, what was their experience in the hotel industry? There's something wrong with this 10,000 hours. There's just something wrong with this notion that you have to have deep expertise in something in order to be successful. But what is it? Why is it that this perfectly explains Serena's success, but does not explain success in entrepreneurial endeavors and in innovation? The reason for this difference is because for Serena Williams, the rules of the game rarely changes.